What if just beyond this season of turmoil is your best season yet? Kevin Wallace dives into how God can turn any season into a time of blessing in his new book, After This. It's available now to order. Receive your copy today by visiting www.kevinwallace.tv. Stand firm and believe there is an After This. Hey family, Kevin Wallace here from Redemption to the Nations Church. I've got a message for you today that I believe God gave me to bring strength and hope and joy to your journey. I want you to get your heart open. I want you to get ready to receive this word. I don't believe your life's ever gonna be the same again. God's getting ready to take you to a new level. I'll see you at the end of this message and we'll pray together. God bless, enjoy this word. Quickly go with me to the book of Colossians, the third chapter. I'm continuing my thought this morning on making room for God. I'll remind you last week we read Luke chapter two, verses four through seven. It says that when Jesus had been born and Mary had carried him to full term, it was time for him to be born. He was born and placed in a manger because there was no room, there was no room for Jesus in the inn. I don't know about you, I don't know how I could can't fathom telling Mary, who's carrying the Son of God, that there's no room for Jesus in my inn. But today I want to tell you that you and I have the privilege and the opportunity to make room for God. How many want Him to have room in your heart? How many want Him to have room in your house? So today we want to talk about for that for just a few moments about making room for God. And I'm going to remind you of something. Chad, I don't know if you have this or not, but on January 1st, everybody say January 1st. January 1st, we're starting what we call the 100 Movement. People are already partnering, pastors and leaders are partnering with us literally around the world. Got some emails this week from people in other nations that are going to be joining us for the 100 Movement. On January 1, we're going to begin the 100 Movement, the first 100 days of the year 2022, we're going to dedicate it to seeking the Lord and drawing closer to God. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to commit a hundred minutes. Now, don't get lighthearted here and don't lose your, don't lose your joy. A hundred minutes a week is about 12 minutes, 14 minutes a day of prayer. How many believe we can pray 12 to 14 minutes a day? Uh huh. We're going to, be, we're going to believe God for 12 to 14 minutes of time in the word every day, a hundred minutes a week in the word of God. For 100 days, we're going to engage in, a, in random acts of kindness. How many know that the Bible says in the Gospel of St. Matthew that men will see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven? And for 100 days, the first 100 days of the year, we're going to spend 100 minutes a week in prayer, 100 minutes in the Word, 100 days of sacrificial gifts, of generosity, Random acts of kindness, being kind in our community to demonstrate the love in the heart of the Father. How many are with me? Say amen. amen. Most everybody's with me that far, and then we get to this last piece, and everybody's like, check out. But we're going to ask you for a hundred days, listen, of consecration or even fasting. You say, Pastor, I can't fast a hundred days. I'm not asking you to go on a hundred day fast of all food. or I'm just asking you to think about giving something up for God for a hundred days. Something you enjoy, preferably, if you don't eat um, Brussels sprouts. Probably a little Debbie would be better for some of us, right? Okay, so, so ju- just a hundred days. Give something up to God for a hundred days. You say, Pastor, what's the purpose and what's the significance of a hundred? Well, first of all, it's obedience to God because he gave us this whole thing. But I believe the church has got to be dedicated to and committed to um, seeking God, drawing close to God. And how many know if we can set our heart toward him for the first 100 days of the year, it's going to change the trajectory of our year. How many want the trajectory of your year to be altered because of how you and I draw close to the Lord? And here's the thing about it. You say, Pastor, you're trying to manipulate God. No, God promises us he will draw near to us if we draw near to him first. So that's what this is about. The one, everybody say the 100 movement. 
If you want more information about it, you can text 100 to 423 uh, Get more information. Lots of pastors are joining us. Other churches are joining us. Devin and I are believing, and we're almost already there, believe it or not, for 100 pastors and their churches to join us for this. So how many are in with Devin and I for the 100 movement? Somebody say amen. 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 So, that, so why did I say that? Because these four weeks of December, we're preparing for the 100 movement. The first week, last Sunday, I talked about making room for God in prayer. Today I'm going to talk about making room for the Word of God in our hearts. How many need to make room and want to make room for the Word of God in your heart? Say amen. amen. So I want to read one passage of Scripture. It's found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Very simple passage of Scripture, but a profound passage of Scripture. And it just simply says this, let the Word of God, the Word of Christ, dwell. Somebody say dwell. Amen. Dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I want us to talk today about making room for the word of God in our hearts. Bow your head and let's pray. Pray for me, I'm praying for you. Father, thank you for the anointing to teach and to preach. Father, I just wanna thank you for what you've already done in this room. For the lives you've already touched and changed, the homes you've helped and healed, for the strength that has come from heaven today, I'm grateful, God. And I'm asking you, Lord, for these next few moments that you will just give me the grace to teach and to preach and that you will give them the ability, the anointing, the grace to receive the word of God in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, amen. You can be seated in the presence of God. So the book of Colossians is a book that Paul wrote to the church at Coloss. And the church at Colossae is under an attack and the attack is actually coming from within now it started without but it eventually worked its way in and now false teaching had begun to saturate the church at Colossae and Paul gets word that his church and his people under his spiritual care at Colossae have begun to entertain heresy and they have begun to entertain heresy regarding the person of Jesus Christ if you read the whole book of Colossians, it's why you will find he continually reiterates and reinforces the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Colossae is dedicated, the book of Colossians rather, is dedicated to uh, an explanation, a reminder, and a spiritual, um, a spiritual reinforcement of the supremacy of the person of Jesus Christ. And that is not just happenstance, that is not just accidental, it is an intentional thing that the Apostle Paul is addressing in the church and he's trying to smash back at the false teachers who are beginning to tell the members of the church at Colossae that Jesus is just one among many or, or Jesus is, is fallen like the rest of us or Jesus is just another man. And Paul says, no, that's, this is not true. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is not just one among many. Jesus is, is not just another one. Jesus is supreme. He is the begotten Son of God. There is no one who approaches His holiness. There is no one who approaches His supremacy. There is no, how many would agree with me? There's nobody like Jesus. And so the Bible is giving us here in the book of Colossians uh, a spiritual, um, uh, a didactic reminder to the people of God in this church that Jesus is alone, the Son of God, begotten of God, born of a virgin, and that there is no one like him, and we should not ever forget that. And in order for the people of God in this church not to be deceived, by false doctrine. He tells them how to combat the false teaching and the heresy that is floating around in the church. And I'm going to tell you something right now, family. Heresy is still a real danger to the church. False doctrine is still a real danger to the church. In fact, this morning I woke up early sometime and the Lord reminded me of that scripture that men and women with itching ears would no longer, listen, no longer endure sound doctrine. You hear that? Men and women would actually, in the church, would no longer endure sound doctrine. And they would heap to themselves false teachers who would, listen, tell them what they want to hear. 
That doesn't sound like the church age we're living in right now. I don't know what does. We'd rather go somewhere and migrate to somebody who tells us what our flesh wants to hear than to be subject to the truth of God that transforms us and sets us free. It's not opinion that sets me free. It's not my perception that sets me free. The Bible said we will know the truth and the truth would make us free. Now, I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to say this to you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruffle some feathers here and I don't want to do that, but I'm going to have to. You need to make up your, your mind and I need to make up my mind in this hour that what we're hungry for most is not what makes us the happiest all the time. It's what makes us holy. And I want to hear something. I don't want to hear something that moves God and makes him a reduced God and, and brings him down on my level. I need to hear a message of truth that reminds me of how impotent and without power I am so that I turn my eyes and look toward the Savior who has promised to give me strength and grace and power to overcome. It's not in us. It's in him. And you need to be reminded today and I need to be reminded today of our lack of self-sufficiency. Our sufficiency is not in ourself. It is in Christ alone. Your hope and my hope is not in our own ability. It is in Christ alone. Paul is reminding the church at Colossae that Jesus Christ is supreme and that he came in the flesh, listen, was fully God and fully man. Some people deny his deity and others deny his humanity. But the beauty of the incarnation is that the son of God became the son of man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. And this is the gospel that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, born of a virgin, and that he came to save the whole world from their sins. And Paul says, if you want to make sure your life is heresy proof, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I am told that there is a department in the FBI that monitors money laundering in our nation. And they have gotten so good at money laundering that they continue to have to change the dollar bill and the 20 and the 100 to, to, to make it uh, protected against all of this fraudulent activity going on. But still to this day, when men are trained in how to detect the faults, they do not give them the false money to handle. They put real money in their hands and they allow them to touch the real thing so much that when false money comes through their hands, they can feel the difference between the fraudulent and the real. And there are people in this room and watching me online today, you specialize in knowing the faults, but you can't properly combat the faults until you have handled and allowed the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. Somebody said you need to study all of the you need to study all the false religions in the world. Listen, let's study the kingdom of God and the word of God. And when a false religion shows up, nobody needs the spirit of uh, the gift of discernment to know that that is not of God. If you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And many people don't handle the truth enough. We do not study the truth enough to know when a lie is being told to us. And if you don't know the truth, you are susceptible to deception. And this is exactly why Paul wrote the book of Colossae. He, the book of Colossians to the church at Colossae, he wanted them to know that Jesus Christ is not just another one among many. He is the son of the living God. And he says, let the word of Christ, and this is unique, the words of Christ dwell in you. And we know that Christ is not the last name of Jesus. We always say Jesus Christ and we act like as if we were saying Kevin Wallace. 
But, but Christ is not his last name. Jesus is his name. Christ is his office. Jesus is Mary's son. Christ is the anointed one and his anointed. And when we say Jesus Christ, we are saying Jesus born of Mary, but anointed by the Holy Ghost for the purpose of demonstrating the kingdom of God. And so when Paul says, let the words of Christ dwell in you, he is saying, I don't just want this, the the, the letter alone to be there. He said, I want the words of this anointed Messiah to be alive on the inside of you and dwell in your heart. This, This book is not just law. This book is love. This, 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 these letters, you understand that most of this book is con- consisting of letters and, 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 and writings that men who were anointed by the Holy Ghost wrote. Do you understand that? I hope you understand that when they wrote, they were breathed on by God for the purpose of bringing revelation to the body of Christ so that we don't walk in darkness. Everybody floating around with a new revelation. But the writer of Hebrews said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Y'all missed it right there. I got a prophecy. I'm glad you got a prophecy. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. I want to tell you this right now. No matter how anointed a man or a woman are, they are still fallible. I didn't get enough amens on that. They may be your favorite. You may send them a gift every month. They may send you a pen back in the mail. But at the end of the day, everyone on this planet, no matter how much they pray, no matter how much they love God, they are fallible. But this book is not fallible. It is infallible. It's why the writer of Hebrews said it is a more sure word of prophecy. Why? Because sometimes men or women decree a thing that never comes to pass. But this word has already come to pass and everything left in the balance shall come to pass because if God said it, he will back it up and finish what he started. It's a more sure word of prophecy. That's the introduction. Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you. This is interesting. The word dwell is the Greek word enochio, and it is the verb form of the noun oikos. Let me just break that down. Oikos is a noun that is is the word house. It's the Greek word oikos, but in the English it means house or dwelling. So in oikos, is enochios is the verb form of the noun house so what paul is trying to say here is let the word of christ live in you let it tabernacle in you one of the dangers and we had this conversation as pastors about the 100 movement giving people uh, uh, a recommendation of 100 minutes a week the, the 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 concern and the And the caution that we had is, if you tell everybody to read 100 minutes a week, it becomes legalism. And it becomes something of law. Uh, and, And I don't want it to become law, but some of us need to understand that we use legalism to excuse our laziness. Get the car warmed up. Get the car warmed up. I'm feeling this. Okay. We use legalism to excuse our laziness. And we don't read the Bible. I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying many in the kingdom today don't read their Bible two minutes a day. And then I stand up and say, we're going to read it a hundred minutes a week. And people say, what a legalist. What a legalist. I am not bound by such. No, you're not bound at all. You're lazy. And the reason there's no fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kind, not yet. Not yet. The reason there's none of that yet in your life is because you think that discipline is legalism. But there is a time in your life when you got to tell your flesh no. And you got to tell the devil now, Julian, shut up. And you got to tell Facebook not right now. And you got to tell Instagram not yet. You got to get into this book and get a word that is joy untweetable and full of glory. 
Hey family, I wanted to pause right in the middle of this message and thank all of our partners who are helping us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ around this nation and around this world. Listen, if the message you're hearing today is bringing strength and life to you, I'd love for you to go to kevinwallace.tv. Check out how we can partner together and how you can be a part of helping us continue to spread this good news of Jesus Christ around the world. Let's get back into the message. I'm praying God bless you and your family today. Enjoy. Let it dwell. Let it live in you. Well, I don't want anyone to bind me. We're not trying to bind anybody. We're trying to help people get set free. I want to tell you this. I've told you, I've disclosed this to you many times. I, I do not prance around up here as if we have figured it out. Devin and I are still a work in progress. We don't wake up every morning. Angels don't carry us to the kitchen. They, they don't sit us down behind a bowl of porridge with an open Bible and say, this is your selected word for the day. Some of you imagine Devin and I, we walk around speaking in tongues in our house all the time. We walk around speaking in tongues. Not the kind of tongues you're thinking of, hallelujah. My point is this, letting the word of God dwell in me is a process. Letting it get in me richly takes time and devotion. And it takes, it takes understanding. It takes some frustration. It takes wrestling. Y'all don't like this. Yeah, this is too basic. Uh, you, you want to pretend that every time you read one scripture, you get six sermons. I don't. There are sometimes I read three chapters and go, what was that? What was that? And you know what I do when I didn't get anything out of it? I don't say, I'm not reading my Bible no more. Bless God, it didn't feed me. You know what I say? There's some food in there. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to open up that cupboard one more time. And I'm going to read those same three chapters because the Bible is breathed on by the Holy Ghost. And God is about to open my eyes to see something. Y'all missing what I'm saying today. I'm telling you, when you let the word of God dwell in you, it's not just one among many things. Things, it might need to be the first thing you do in the morning. It might need to be the best thing that you do all day long is devote yourself to time in the Word of God. And I want to tell you something. There's a reason why Jesus said when you go into the secret place, shut the door. Because if you don't shut the door, stuff will follow you in to pull you out. I don't say this for any other reason except merely explanation and vulnerability and authenticity. I'm being transparent. The staff will tell you. When they walk by my office in our hallway, in our, in our office across the street, if they hear music playing, don't knock on the door. Is that fair? Is that fair? It's been that way for as long as I've been in the ministry. Why are you saying that? Because if you hear music playing or you hear me hollering in tongues, it is not the time to ask me to sign a piece of paper. I didn't get no amens, but I'm setting myself free right now. I want to tell you that some of you have got to learn the value of time with God. And you've got to shut a door behind you and you've got to tell to-do list, you can wait. I have found out in my life that if I will invest my time in the Word and in prayer, I'll get more done with less time than I would have with more time. Let the Word dwell in you richly. Let it overflow. I'm going to give you, I'm just going to, I want you to look at Matthew 13 and then we're going to be done. This is, this is going to be perfect. It's going to be great. It's a gift. What are I do with my Bible? It's hiding under the bush here. <laughs> Matthew 13 and I'm through. Somebody say, let the word. Come on, talk to me. Say, let the word dwell in you richly. Matthew 13. Now, he tells a parable of the sower. Everybody see this? Verse 2. Great multitudes gathered. And they gathered together to him so that he got into a boat, sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. 
Put it in perspective, get an image. He's in a boat on a lake. They're on the shore listening to him preach. Then he said to them, in parables, verse 3. Somebody say in parables. Behold, a sower went out to sow. He sowed, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. Say wayside. Birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places. Say stony places. They did not have much earth there and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they got scorched. And they did this because they had no root and they withered away. And then some seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and choked out the seeds. But others, look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm an other. My God, I'm an other. Now, you can choose to be, this is, this is what's crazy about this parable. The sower is the same. The seed is the same. The only thing that determines the harvest and its capacity is the soil. I'm getting ready to set preachers free all over America right now. Because there are people in churches. There are people in our church who float from church to church and blame their lack of growth on the seed and the sower. Yep, take a big deep breath, keep the car warm, hallelujah. They go around saying things like, I didn't get fed there. Or that didn't really minister to me. The reality of it is, after 40 years of Christian experience, if you've not grown in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, you could be arrogant enough to continue to blame the 30 churches you've been a member of and you could poor mouth the pastor that fed you all those 40 years or you could do what James says and take a look in the mirror of the word and say to yourself, I'm not the kind of soil that I should be and I need to get rid of some of the junk in me so that the seed that I'm laying down can produce harvest in my life. Where's my Genesis? I think she's not feeling well so they took her in the back. Oh, she's over there in the dark. My Jesus. You see her? She is eight months old, 28 pounds of juiciness. You hear me? She has mas grande cachetes. Come on, all my Spanish family, you have chiquis, come on. Me and Devin last night, Devin more so than me. Two o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. Get a bottle, Devin. Five scoops. Five ounces, shake the bottle, put it in the baby's mouth. She needs to burp. Oh, God, okay. Oh, burp, 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 burp. She gets full, she burps, she goes to sleep. At 19 years old, if Isaiah gets in my bed, stand up, Isaiah. Stand up, Isaiah. If Isaiah comes to my bed at 19 years old and says, I'm hungry. I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do. It's not mix a bottle. It's not mix a bottle. At 19 years old, he knows where the kitchen is. He knows where the cupboard is. He knows where the Doritos are. He knows where the Sprite is. He know, 
I'll get to your Oreos in a minute. Whatever it is you go for. At 19 years old, you ought to know, sir, how to feed yourself. And there are some people in the kingdom of God, all the seed that's been sown into your heart, it cannot be the seed and it cannot be the sower. At some point, we've got to say there's too much stony places. There's too many thorns. There's too much wayside. God, change me. I'm closing with this. We have become tribal in the church of the living God. What do you mean, Bishop? I mean that we migrate into tribes that feed us what we want to be fed and they say what we want to hear and they look like us and they're the same color as us and they voted like us and they live in the same socioeconomic place that we do and so that's our tribe. The problem with that is that is not the kingdom of God. When you begin to sow seed in the kingdom of God, oh, I feel like preaching here. The Bible said that the mustard seed grows up into a tree and the tree catches all kinds of birds and it lodges in its branches this house is not just for the right or the left or the black or the white or the republican or the democrat or the rich or the poor keep the car warmed up you might have driven here in a Rolls Royce you may have walked here or catch a car to bus however you got here you're here by the blood of the lamb and we're family in the kingdom of God I'm going to tell you something right now I'm I'm trying to close in here I've seen young people be good ground. And I've seen older people be wayside. I've seen seasoned people be good ground. I've seen younger people be stony places. You can't determine the harvest of the seed sown simply by looking at an age demographic. You can't determine the capacity and the scope of the harvest simply by looking at the color of skin. You can't determine the capacity and the size of harvest simply by looking at the bank account of the person listening. The ground that you have in your heart is known only to you and God. And if you're not getting the kind of harvest in your life that you want, I challenge you to take inventory of the soil of your spirit. Why? Because of the four types of soil, there's only four, of the four types of soil that the seed is planted into. Do you understand the challenge of a sower? I'm a sower. Today, I'm just throwing seed out. Now, I'm hollering and sweating while I throw seed out, but that's how I throw seed. Do you understand that while seed is leaving my mouth and I'm speaking under the power of God, the seed is flying out and it's falling on different kinds of soil. The first kind was wayside. You know what that is? It's ground that has been walked on and mashed down and hardened by the sun. And when seed falls on the wayside, it is exposed and the birds of the air can see it laying on top of the soil. So what do they do? They run down and snatch the seed because birds will eat your seed. I said demonic spirits will steal your seed. And some of us in this room have been walked on, stepped on, beat down, and we've gotten hardened, and we've lost our tenderness, and we haven't cultivated the soil of our heart. And every time somebody sows seed, it can be good seed and a decent sower. But if it's not going down into the soil, the birds, demonic powers, come and snatch the seed. The second kind was stony ground little layer of dirt but underneath that little layer of dirt a whole bunch of rocks 
And here's what those people are like. They initially grab the seed. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, 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 glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Two weeks later, where'd they go? Oh, we heard they're not coming back. Where'd they go? They're not going anywhere. They're just tired of church. Tired? Two weeks? We've been dealing with these demons for 30 years. You've been wrestling something two weeks and can't get the victory? I'll tell you why. Too much rock in your soul. And when the word gets down in the soil and it tries to go down and grow roots, that root system hits a rock. And when it hits a rock, the roots can't grow and the sun comes out. And I want to tell you, no matter how holy and how much you love Jesus and how many tithes you pay and how many gifts of the Spirit you have, the sun's coming. And it's hot sometimes. Y'all don't like this, do you? But it gets hot. Anybody ever felt the heat of hell trying to breathe down your neck and you felt the fire of the enemy turned up seven times hotter against you? And what do you do? What happens when the heat gets turned up? If you don't have any roots, I tell you what happens. You fry the seed. Some of you are fried. The seed's trying to go deep, but it can't get deep. And b- before you know it, that quick, be all excited about serving God. In three weeks, four weeks, a month, six months later, hell break loose in your house, and you start getting, here's what the book says, they got offended. I got offended at God. It didn't work out like I thought it was going to. So now I'm not going to serve God anymore. That preacher told me that, that God was good and bad things have happened. I'm not serving that kind of God anymore. What's wrong? You got rocks in your heart. I'm not mad at you. I'm trying to help you understand that when you got the right kind of soil and you got a tender spirit, hell can break loose and you don't charge God foolishly. Do you understand that's why Job got double in the end? Job got double in the end because after he lost everything, his wife walked out the, can I preach like I feel like preaching? His wife walked out the back door. His body is broken out in boils. He has lost his children. He has lost his inheritance. He's lost his house. He's lost his cattle, everything he had, but that nagging wife was gone. She walks out, looks at his bull ridden body and said, why don't you just curse God and die? And he looks at her with nothing to gain, having lost it all, and said, sweetheart, you talk like a foolish woman. Naked I came in, and naked I'm going out. I'm still going to declare, blessed be the name of the Lord. And even though he slay me, you yet will I continue to trust in my God. And the Bible said that in all this, Job never charged God foolishly. My problem with the church in today's generation is that they go through a little bit of tribulation and they turn back and blame God as if God is the one that sent it. you got to learn how to walk through it and lift up your eyes to the hills from whence cometh your help and say, devil, I will not turn around. I've come too far to look back. If God be for me, I feel a praise breaking out in this place. I don't know if she's here this morning. I'd never embarrass her. I don't think she is. Sweet Ann Chapman. Ann, I don't know if you know Miss Ann, precious sister that sits over on the left, and when she gives a message in tongues, everybody gets quiet because you know the Holy Ghost is talking. Everybody know who I'm talking about now? This past week, her sweet husband, Bob Chapman, went home to be with the Lord. I called her Friday on my way home from a respite. I said, Miss Ann, I'm just checking on your sweetheart. I heard Bob just went to heaven. I expected to hear her molly grubbing and oh, woe is me. And I thought she would be all down in the dumps. And she said, oh, Bishop, the Lord met me in a prayer meeting three nights ago. And she, t- she said, Bishop, God told me he was taking his son home. And when he told me he was taking his son home, I said, I'm not going to argue with God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want to tell you right now, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him and her out of them all. If you've been through hell, don't stop and get mad at God. Keep
keep on trusting in the Lord. If you keep on reading in the book of Job, Job lost it all, but he kept his faith. And in the end, God opened up the windows of heaven and gave Job back double everything. Listen, I'm believing that the message God gave me today is ministering strength to you, bringing hope for your tomorrow. And if this message and the ministry that God's given us is bringing life to you in any way, I'd love for you to consider praying, partnering with Kevin Wallace Ministries, helping us to bring this good news of Jesus Christ to even more people around this country and around this world. If you'd like more information about what we're doing, how you can be a part of it, go to kevinwallace.tv check it out today. You'll also find a place there where you can leave us your prayer request. And our team and I are going to take your prayer request to God. Pray earnestly for God to turn your situation all the way around. I love you. I thank God for all of our partners and those who are about to join the partnership. Let's see what God's going to do together in our future. Can't wait. God bless. The third thing, third sowing, I'm almost there. Seed fell on thorns. Thorns are unique when you sow seed on them. Thorns will choke out and overtake other plants. And Jesus, when explaining the thorns, said, the thorns represent the cares of this life. I'm getting ready to give you a phrase that's gonna really chap the religious people. Ready, say this with me, say, I don't care. I don't care. You say, Pastor, that, that's not true. You do care. No, I'm just telling you, I'm not going to be ate up with care. Who, by, by any act of worry, can add one cubit to their stature? Who of you, by any amount of worry, can provide for yourself tomorrow? Jesus said, Solomon and all his splendor could not compare with a lily. Solomon and all his splendor could not compare with a lily. And then he says this, and then there are the birds. <laughs> they don't stay up all night wondering how a mindless sparrow flying through the air and looks on the ground and sees in the earth a little worm God provided that filet mignon of a worm for that sparrow flying through the air. And Jesus says this, are you not better than the birds? I don't care. It don't matter. He's going to take care of you. If he clothed the lilies, and he feeds the sparrow. I got one question for you before I go to my last point. Are you not better than the birds? Amen. Thorns will choke out your life. And some of you are staying up all night long to produce a life that nobody's watching you live. And nobody even cares if you're living it. I know men who work 100 hours a week to provide so that their family can live a lifestyle. And their homes are falling apart. Because stuff doesn't give you joy. And worrying all your life about more, 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 and how, how, how produces nothing except ulcers and a lack of peace. Look at somebody tell them, don't care. Stop being so full of care. Cast all your cares on him for he careth for. He said, you stop caring because I'm already caring. He, he cares. Last, last thing, seed sowing, throwing seed out. Falls on the wayside, birds take it. Falls on the shallow soil, sun scorches it. Fall isn't, falls into thorns, thorns choke it out. But the last group is the good ground. It said, and there were others. Some, look at somebody, tell them there were others. Tell them I'm the other. Here's what it said. When the seed fell on good soil, some produced 30, some produced 60. 
How many would expect that the next one is 90? Come on, come on. They taught me this in, in grade school growing up. You have to be able to predict. 30, 30 plus 30 is 60, 60 plus 30 is, but it doesn't say 30, 60, 90. It says 30, 60. Why does it say that? Because unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above. Religion tells you it's 30, 60, 90. The kingdom, the kingdom says it's 30, 60, 100. I want to tell you we're moving into 100-fold harvest on seed that has been sown. You say, how do you have the authority to say that? Because I refuse to believe it's just 30. Don't get mad at me if I believe it's more than 60. What if God does exceeding abundantly above? Mix your faith with a hundredfold. You've been declaring good things over your kids. How many have been declaring good things over your kids? Wait till God blows your mind. Wait till God blows your mind. They're not just going to get a job you've been praying for. They're going to own companies. Yeah, I got four of y'all that received that, but receive it. I'm trying to build your faith to help you understand God doesn't just do what we ask him to do. He actually waits on us to ask so that he can exceed what we ask or... He takes pleasure in that when you let the word dwell in you. Stand with me. I, I want to ask you to do something that may feel like discipline at first. I want you to make commitments to your family and to yourself and to, to God that as we rush toward 2022, our commitment level to the word of God is going to another level. Jesus says something profound when the disciples ask him, why do you teach in parables? Don't miss this. He said, I teach in parables and this is really what parables are about. It's about separating the curious from the committed. Some people were listening to him talk, but didn't understand what he was saying. And there are a lot of curious people in church that want the blessings of the kingdom, but they don't want to hear the word of the kingdom. So God will often disguise the kingdom to determine who's curious from who's committed. And I'm not... I'm not, listen to me carefully. I'm not saying curiosity is bad. I'm just saying there's more. You can't just remain a curious Christian all your life. At some point, you got to get committed. I'm just, you know, I'm hearing this word a lot in my generation. I'm deconstructing my faith. Really what you're saying is you're trying to disguise apostasy. Be very careful. Stop entertaining demonic voices. Stop allowing bitterness and church hurt to transform the kingdom of God into something that came to hurt you. People in church may have hurt you. Jesus and his kingdom never will. There's a lot of people who drag their stuff into the conversation. Well, I got hurt in the church as if God did it. They're just some jacked up people in churches. And rather than getting bitter at God and his church, forgive people that have hurt you and move on. I'm not going to church with hypocrites. I'd rather go to church with one than to hell with one. It's just a true story. So, I want to say this to you. Um, Pastor Justin, where are you at, friend? Lift your hand, Pastor Justin. When do we relaunch um, house fires? Are they in right now? March. So come March. And, and we take a break in the, in the winter months, travel, that kind of thing, and people not getting out in the cold, we get all that. We, we just came to an end of house fires. Some people continue to meet and fellowship. We encourage that. Come March, we'll relaunch house fires. What's a house fire, Pastor? It's where a, a host family brings other families into their home, and they just do life together, and they talk about the Word. And things that I preached, or things Dev, Pastor Devin's preached, or things Pastor Richie, or Pastor Quantel, or... Pastor Chris or whoever preached it, we just, we talk about that some more. Let me say something to you. If it's a house fire, it's sanctioned and blessed by this house and by the leadership of this house. 
Fair enough? If it's not a house fire and you get invited to it, ask a bunch of questions. Why? Because in a church this big, we can't control everything happening. And the last thing I want you to do is get invited to something that's got a nasty spirit. You don't have to say amen, but it happens in a church like this. You got to be real careful. I don't control everything. I don't put my thumb on everything. I'm not a micromanager. I encourage the body to grow and to fellowship and to connect. But you got to be careful when people have an agenda. And at the end of the day, I'm a shepherd. And shepherds love sheep. And so I just want to make sure you understand when we start house fires and Bible studies, we know who's leading them and we know what they're teaching. And if they get out of line, we fix that. Why is that important? Because I don't want you to be exposed to foolishness. That's all I want to say. So I want you to be a part of a house fire when they come back around. I want you to get involved in the 100 movement. I want you to begin to read the Bible. And it may start out feeling like discipline. But devotion begins to flow. And you begin to love what dwells in you richly. And it goes beyond black letters on a white page. It becomes rhema. And rhema begins to speak and set stuff inside of you free. How many can be honest today and say, Pastor Kevin, I I want my word life to go to another level. If it's you, lift your hand. Can I just, can we just be real? How many can say, Pastor, I find it challenging to have a committed word life. And don't be ashamed, don't be ashamed. Uh, There've been seasons as your pastor, I've gone through what I would call dry seasons where I'd sit down and read and just, Pastor Josh, just be honest with me, it wasn't, I'm like feet, I'm trying to get fed, I'm, I'm struggling here. And the breakthrough didn't come when I disconnected. The breakthrough came when I stayed committed and devoted. And it began to speak to me. I began to see things I'd never seen. He gives you a lens of revelation through which you can see stuff that the natural mind cannot perceive. How many want that to happen in your life and in your family? Lift your hand, I wanna pray for you and I'm gonna let you go today. There's a, there's a real close similarity between a long sermon and a hostage situation. I'm, I'm bordering on it right now, right? Some of you are like, my stomach is talking, it's not you anymore, it's my stomach, right? Just tell it to be quiet another minute, let me pray for you, okay? Jesus, I thank you for every hand that just went up. There's some true hunger in here today. Satisfy us, Lord, in our search for your word. Send your spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus to rest on us as we read the Bible. And while we're there, God, let there be a sweet communion between us and your Holy Spirit as we break the bread of life. Feed us till we want no more. Come on, ask him. Feed us till we want no more. We pray, God, today that you will speak to our hearts through your word. I pray for a revival of Bible reading in this house. That people who've shelved it and put it in a place, and it's not a place of priority. Today, God, we repent. We change our mind. We ask you, Lord, to fill our heart with a hunger for the word. Holy Spirit, I pray this week in Jesus' name that you will touch lives and that you will quicken the word of God to them. Let the rhema word, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every preceding word, every rhema word from God. So speak to us, Lord. Let us have fellowship with you in your word. Now lift your hands and just let him, let him seal that right now before we go. Father, seal it. Let the word of God, let the word of God come alive. Let the word of God come alive. Let the word of God come alive. Lord, let our commitment level to your kingdom and to your word, let it just rise and let let our engagement and encounter in the word, let our hearts burn with us like the two men on their way to Emmaus. As you spoke to them from the word of God, the Bible said their hearts burned within them. God, we pray that our hearts would burn within us again. In Jesus' name. Now look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, let the word, tell them, let the word. Tell them you got to let it. Let the word dwell in you richly this week. In Jesus' name. Hey family, while your faith is high and while God is speaking to you through this message today, I wanted to end this time together by saying a prayer for you and agreeing with you in prayer that God is going to meet you right where you are at the point of your need. 
As we pray, I want you to remember this, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. You don't have a problem. All you need is faith in God. And today we're going to agree in prayer together for your healing, for your deliverance, for the miracle, for the blessing that you've been waiting on. I believe it's time to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the people of God who are watching today. Thank you for everyone who has tuned in to this, this message and this broadcast. And we are agreeing in prayer right now that every need they have, you are going to supply it. Father, I reach out to you in faith and I pray for the person who has lost that you would save them. For the person who is sick that you would bring healing right now to their body. Father, for the person who needs a miracle financially, a miracle in their home, a miracle in their marriage, there's nothing too hard for you. And in Jesus' name, we speak to that issue. We command those mountains to be moved and we thank you in advance for your blessing that's coming up on their lives today. In Jesus' name, we receive it, amen. Friend, I can't wait to be with you next week. I'm going to keep praying for you until then. God bless you, spread the news, and we'll see you soon. Go in peace.